All right. Hey, all. Uh, it's been a while since I uh, spoke at this conference. It's uh, great to uh, be here presenting again. And uh, so uh, for a change of pace, I won't be doing the usual uh, uh, Dynalink talk uh, that I'm doing, uh, that I've been doing uh, in all previous cases that I was presenting here. Rather, this is more of a, like a hands-on case study of uh, uh, what happens when you try to implement a language on the JVM and uh, specifically uh, some, some, some of the things that we sort of like lessons learned while we were trying to fit NASA on the JVM with a specific uh, focus on, on integration features between your language and the underlying platform. As for uh, the things that are related to the like generating bytecode for the language itself and so on. I won't be talking about that. That will be Marcus' uh, talk uh, on Wednesday. I will be uh, more uh, focused on the, on, the, on the actual integration features. You'll see what those are. The typical, I work for Oracle. Uh, okay, this is your typical, I work for Oracle slide. Um, what I want to talk to is uh, uh, intricacies in uh, writing adapter classes when invoke dynamic is involved. Some fun with type conversions. Things with handling arrays, this is, a, this is actually a little bit surprising that uh, you need to take care of that thing, but it uh, turns out that there is a, th th there's things with that. Then there is uh, how do we provide the illusion of the existence of packages in your language and whether it's a good idea to do it at all. And of course, I will be talking about Dynalink uh, in, the, in, in the linking section and also about security, which is an often overlooked uh, uh, issue, but for us it's fairly crucial in, uh, in NASHON because uh, of course, this thing will ship in, in Java 8, and of course, it will be living in JRE libx, which means that it will run with all privileges. So, uh, and uh, I want nothing less in my life than to be the guy in the spotlight as being responsible for the next uh, security vulnerability in Java. So we are trying to be very conscious about that. So you want to write a language on the JVM. Well, uh, OK. And uh, you can have a language that lives in a vacuum and doesn't integrate with your <laughs> platform in any way, or you want to have some integration uh, features that I just uh, listed. Uh, without much further ado, we'll just jump head, uh, head first into the things. I uh, tried really hard to cut down this talk, and I still ended up with way too many slides. So, uh, but uh, you know, I'm comfortable. This audience can keep, keep up the pace, so it will be fine. Uh, typical, I mean, in most dynamic languages, if you're do, uh, doing this thing, so th this is how you implement a, a runnable in NAS one. You just say new Java lang runnable, uh, pass it an object literal after actually the parentheses, that's a syntax extension, but you don't need to do that. Uh, and uh, the object literal has a, has, a, has a member run, which is a function that does something. Uh, it can be even simpler because uh, we support uh, passing a function to the constructor if the thing is actually a, a, a single abstract uh, method type. So uh, without further ado, we can just do a new Java lang runnable, pass it a function, that's it. All right. Um, obviously, we create adapter classes, proxies, if you will. Uh, but ob also, obviously, we are not using Java lang reflect proxy because we're not doing reflection, we are doing invoke dynamic. So how does the... Uh, how does a adapter class look when it's implemented around invoke dynamic? Well, normally it looks like this uh, on fields level. Um, obviously, I cannot put uh, the full code of this class on a single slide because it would be, you would really need to have really good eyes for that. So we'll go by, uh, in, in, in small bite size chunks. So uh, uh, first thing is the package. Uh, we normally try to define the uh, adapter class in the same package where the uh, where the uh, interface or being implemented or class being adapted lives, except that you cannot d uh, define uh, things in the Java lang and the associated packages. So in that case, we just define it in some internal stuff. Uh, we have a field for the defining uh, uh, global context for, for JavaScript. This is language specific. You might need it, you might not need it, we need it. And then you have a method handle for all the methods that uh, can be implemented. Uh, interestingly, for interfaces, we will allow overriding, so, so uh, overriding of two string hash code and equals as well. So uh, aside from a field for a method handle for run, you have two string hash code and equals here. So 
how does a constructor for this thing look like? You need to get your, an object literal that carries the functions that are the implementations for your thing. So our constructors, even if they normally, the, the, the class constructor, right? So the runnable will have as a sub superclass JavaLang object. JavaLang object has a zero argument constructor. We'll always create constructor that takes an additional parameter. So if you have five constructors, we will define those same five constructors, but with a tagged on object argument that will, that will carry the information. Uh, that will carry the implementation. And what we do is that uh, we, we pass this, uh, we pass a name of a function and the object to a, to a library method uh, that we have that extracts the handle and then puts it in a field. And I repeat this for the every method handle field, but no, no, no big deal. If you were to write this in Java, it would look something like that. So for every field, you would just do a, uh, this get handle where you pass the object, pass the name of the function that you want to get back, and you pass the signature that you expect back from your method handle. Again, not terribly complicated. Uh, this library function that we use, the get handle, what it does is, uh, is uh, uh, again, some JavaScript specific stuff. Uh, uh, normally, this is, this is the meat of it, is that uh, you retrieve the, the member from your script object. If it's a script function, then you do some things like bi uh, bind that handle to the, to, to, uh, to, to the receiver, and then adapt handle is just uh, something that massages types. Um, otherwise, otherwise bad, bad things ensue. And we also have this little quirk is that since every JavaScript object does have a two string by virtue of its prototype, we don't just blindly use it because it will always be found. We only override it if it's like specifically defined on the object itself. So if, the, if you pass an object literal that only inherits two string through its prototype, then we won't use that as an override, which uh, otherwise would lead to uh, surprising results. Uh, if the uh, interface being implemented is a, is a single abstract method interface, then we will generate yet another constructor. So for every original public or protected constructor, we emit one that takes an object, and we might emit another one that, only, that takes a script function this time. Uh, and in that case, what we do is we associate that uh, single passed function with the, uh, with, the, with the actual SAM method, and all the other methods, to string equals, hash code, and so on, they're initialized to null. Uh, if this code were written in Java, we generate bytecode with, with asm, then it would look something like this. So you again go to your, our service class, uh, tell it, hey, here's a function adapted to this method type, store it in the run field, and all the other guys are null. We also, have, uh, we, we also store the uh, defining context that we need, and the last line is obviously the uh, the, uh, the no pointer check. So for every public construction, uh, for every public or protected construct in the superclass, we will emit one or two new constructors that have an additional uh, object or maybe an additional script function argument. Um, we had a little bit of a debate whether the include this extra argument at the beginning of the parameter list or at the end of the parameter list for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the constructor. Uh, putting it at the end prevailed. I, I personally sort of objected to it because it meant that uh, var arg constructors can no longer be var arg, but uh, eh, whatever, I was overvoted. So so now the adapters will, will not be, the, the variable arity of a constructor in a superclass will unfortunately not be preserved. This is something that you might want to uh, consider in, in your language or not. Um, the fun thing is that at the runtime, when you are doing this thing at the start, when I said that you can do this or you can do this, the, the actual dispatching, so, so which constructor gets invoked, we don't have any special code for that. It's completely handled by DynoLink's overloaded method resolution. You know, if you get a script function, it will invoke the constructor that takes a script function. In every other case, it will invoke the one with the object. So uh, how do the methods look like, right? Uh, so a run will typically, an, an, an normally, an implementation of a method that's uh, abstract in superclass, you load your field with the method handle. If it's not null, you do your thing. If it's null, well, just throw an unsupported operation exception. That's it. Uh, of course, this is, this is grossly simplified. Uh, for a non-abstract method, uh, what you do is that if your method handle is null, you will just do an invoke special, which is basically a super invocation. Again, not... Uh, terribly big deal. 
Of course, it gets more complicated because this is invoke dynamic and every invoke exact can throw trouble. So you actually need to uh, uh, have exception handlers around this thing. Uh, obviously, runtime exception and error can just be rethrown and for and if the method originally declares itself any checked exceptions, you can just rethrow those. For everything else, you need to uh, obviously uh, construct something. We, we construct a new runtime exception and throw that. That's for throwable. Uh, I actually just realized when I was writing this is in bytecode oftentimes you can do like uh, like a little optimizations that otherwise don't come out in Java C as in uh, so this is the catch block for uh, for throwable but you need to construct a new runtime exception and it turned out that the the shortest way to do this is is this I mean how often do you get to use dupe x1 right all the time <laughs> yes maybe yeah they really liked it uh, again, in Java, this would like normally would look like uh, look like this. So if your field is n your method handler field is not just go to super, otherwise just do an invoke exact on your actual thing. Of course, it's, it's more complicated because we have this whole context object thing, which you might exist in your language or not. So we need to have code that checks whether this context is the same that you had when it was created. If not, temporarily switch to the new one, and then in the final block, block restore the previous one. Again, this is this is like tedious details that you don't really want to pay a lot of attention to, but unfortunately, sometimes you just have to. All right, uh, quick question. Am I going too fast? Yes? What? Oh, dupe x1. Yeah. Okay. In terms of individual methods in your code, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, for me, it was just one of those, uh, like, uh, I was thinking, how can I write this most efficiently? I was like, hey, dupex one, why not? Yes. Your, uh, your yellow font is, is hard to read. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I don't think I really use it a lot more than here, so fine, but thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have another thing, which is... Uh, uh, so the, these are so-called instance-bound adapters. So when you are invoking the constructor, you are passing an object with a behavior. But uh, you might also want to have a situation when you, are, when you have uh, class-based behavior. So you want an adapter where on the class level, uh, the behavior is already defined. So if you create several instances of it, they will all have the same behavior. We do actually have this in uh, Nashorn. I think originally the... Uh, it came about as a need for JavaFX because in JavaFX you you don't uh, you don't instantiate your FX application. Rather, the JavaFX framework accepts that you just pass them a class and it will internally somehow instantiate it itself. So we needed so, so we needed this as well. So when you have this uh, ad, uh, constructor with a class behavior, uh, you suddenly well suddenly you acquire a whole new set of uh, fields. You can have an instance global, you can have a static global, you have the method handles for instance behavior because even with the, with the class-based behavior, you can still at the construction time specify additional overrides for instance-based behavior. So it becomes like a two-step overrides at that point. Uh, so we have static uh, fields for, uh, for, for uh, method handles for static behavior and instance fields for, for instance behavior. It's, uh, yes? Um, so your, your, your run method um, currently picks up the, yes. the self-bound um, method handle and then runs it. Um, yes. But your, your run method could also have picked it up and then run it with a pretended argument. Well, we do bind it because it's still uh, in JavaScript, that object literal, the implementation could say this something, right? So that's why we bind it. Oh no, it's not the self object. It's the global object of the runtime context. That's not the self. Oh, there's no self object No, no, there's no self object here. They're all bound into the uh, method handle. The, uh, the, uh, the global is actually the, the global context, the thing that uh, contains things like the function prototype and so on that, uh, that it needs. So that's not the, that's not the equivalent of this. 
it's actually the, the, the current runtime environment's global object. It still seems to me that you don't need to double all those elements of blocks, but that's hmm. just the way it works. Well, uh, all can be. All can be overridden on an instance basis, so, so uh, in this case we do. But these are two different classes, so we, we emit two different adapter classes. If you're doing instance-based behavior, you get one, and in this case you get the other one. So, uh, and of course, in this case we need to uh, initialize the, 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 the class-based uh, object, uh, is, is, is a class-based behavior, is initialized in the static initializer, and here's, here's, here's actually a conundrum, how do you pass uh, an argument to a static initializer, right? So the only thing that we could come up is, well, pass it in a thread local. So uh, our, uh, our uh, method uh, that, uh, that does the, 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 the Java extend where you pass the type and uh, pass the object, if you go back here, what this guy does is it creates this adapter but, and sets a thread local with this object. And, uh, and, then, and then loads the class, and then as part of the class loading, it will retrieve the object from the, uh, from the thread local. But, you know, that's what you have to do. It's uh, not really any better way to pass it, but since you know that everything happens on that, single, on that one thread, uh, I think it's a perfectly valid way to, uh, to, to, to pass information to a static initializer. What's the stack actually going to do that? Sorry? Yes, it does because when we load the class, we uh, specifically set the resolve uh, flag to true, which means we want the class to be resolved, and the resolution uh, means running static initializers. Well, you are right. Oh, wait. Yeah, but uh, so another so another thread is in the middle of, of already already doing the initialization, mm -hmm. and it will it will wait for that other thread to finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it would still but then it would still not see the thread local. So uh, so um, hmm, it's interesting. Thanks uh, thanks for bringing this up to uh, bring this up because I, I I want to look into that whether the uh, initialization is uh, is is a, is guaranteed to go on the same thread, but. Yeah, I hope he, yeah, I, I ho hope it's right. I mean, it did work so far. So, uh, <laughs> so and, uh, and then obviously the, the, uh, the individual implementations of these classes, uh, the, uh, of, of the methods, will uh, basically say, hey, do I have an instance-based override? I do invoke exact that. No, I don't. I, do I have a static override? Invoke that. Otherwise, default to super. Yep. The class, uh, well, it cannot be loaded. What do you mean already loaded? I mean, you have another snippet of code that uses runner. Oh. And then with, you, you encounter a snippet of with, code that Nope. If, if, you, if you're doing this, doing the Java extend yeah. with, a, with a class name and a, and a class-based behavior uh, uh, object literal, which actually can be any object expression. It doesn't have to be literal, but usually is. Um, uh, a new class is loaded every time. So a new private class loader is being defined and a new class is loaded into it. We generate the bytecode only once, but then we just keep it around as a byte array. But uh, we, we, are, we are instantiating a new class every time because we need a fresh set of static fields, obviously. Yes? For what it's worth, this is how we are doing both of these cases in JRuby for the past six years. Yeah, I'm red, sure. Red local and all, so. Yeah, okay, excellent. It um, works. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes? Well, because, I mean, this is the like Java equivalent code. You need to have a lot of try catches because invoke exact can throw trouble. Yeah, but you know, um, um, usually you know if you cover your runtime or some Java things. Mm -hmm. If it's some Java things, <coughs> it can throw exception. Yep. And you have to use a, a try catch. Otherwise, your uh, um, <coughs> exception are already uh, wrapped, so you don't need to catch it to 
My exception is wrapped. Sorry, I'm not. I, I don't think I follow. It's already an exception which is generated from your runtime. Right. So it's already in the uh, correct. <laughs> Oh yeah, you're right about that. Is the so what I'm showing you here? But if uh, if it were a, a method that in the superclass actually declares that it throws some checked exception, then that thing will just uh, be allowed to uh, be allowed to propagate. Okay, said differently. Why do you use invoke exact here and not invoke dynamic? Because if it's invoke dynamic, you know, and you can uh, do the try catch. At oh, you mean uh, I could. Normally. Oh, you mean that I could uh, I could emit bytecode with invoke dynamic that I would then afterwards. You have, you have a, a metal under that do that. You have a metal under that do the try catch. He's suggesting that you oh. could compress your code idioms down into custom expanded invoke dynamic. Use invoke dynamic as a bytecode macro. Yeah. Mm, yes, we could use that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. I could probably just do a do a do a catch exception uh, combinator there at that point, and uh, yeah, but uh, you can do that at call site and not at server. Mm -hmm. Not statically. Yes. So that at call site, you know what is the exception. Exactly. Well, I guess we could. It's just the idea was that we have a method handler. We have to somehow invoke it, and uh, I don't mind, uh, you know, generating a small amount of bytecode, because it does amount, in the end, to a small amount of bytecode, especially try-catch blocks, right? So it's just a, it's just a try. Um, yes, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really a big deal. I, I still feel like uh, I, I prefer, if I, can, if I can help it, to uh, have a little bit of like static. I mean, if I'm generating code already, I might as well just you know, generate that bytecode instead, uh, instead of resorting to invoke dynamic. But you're right, it's not. It's not uh, this is not the, the only valid solution. You have something to add to the chat? Then, then you have to also wonder how many additional levels of Lambda forms you're adding to do the rest of that code. Rather yes. than well, the there might be that as well, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fairly happy with this one. is not a magic uh, thing to say. I would yeah. not use invoke dynamic. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, here we, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly happy with how this works, so. I have a different question. Which yes? Uh, yes, it does. Corresponding call to invoke exactly in your previous simpler example also take O as a parameter? It should. I mean, these are like handwritten codes, so if I manage to, I'm not sure which one, this one? Yep. Sometimes, I, sometimes I'm showing exactly the one, and sometimes I'm showing it with a two string, and sometimes equals. I'm not, not using the same uh, example all the time. So maybe, maybe at some points I'm here, here I'm using two string for example. So. Well, yes, you have the adapters this, and then you have the JavaScript this, and they are distinct, obviously. So. Yep. All right. Where were we? Okay. All right. So. Uh, okay. So, a uh, fun thing is uh, is uh, figuring out overrides and uh, and and and, uh, and overloads. So. Um, how do you override overloaded methods? Because in JavaScript, it doesn't have the concept of, uh, of uh, type signatures, right? So what we adopted as a policy, and again, design decision that has its trade-offs, is uh, if you have a named function, it will act as an override for all overloads of the same name. If some of those are abstract and others are not abstract, we don't care. All of them will be overridden and implemented by that single function. And it's your job to just, you know, on JavaScript side, if you need to distinguish the behavior for different overloads, you will just have to inspect the argument list on your own and, and do your own dispatch. There's really nothing you can do. This is a JavaScript specific issue. It is what it is. Um, security, as I said, security is a big thing for us. Only we, we are very strict about only extending, implementing public classes, interfaces. And those that are in restricted packages are subject to access check. This only works if you have a security manager present. Otherwise, it's free for all, obviously. Uh, you can only override public and protected methods. And so far, we are preventing over, 
implementing of color sensitive methods because uh, they would uh, they would uh, well they would mess up with the the right color identification it might be something that we might do about that sometime in the future but uh, and it's currently, I don't think there's currently a good solution for this. Like having some transparent, I'm operating on behalf of this code. So I'm like transparent as far as color identification goes, but let's not go there right now. Um, there's actually not too many color sensitives that you can override in JDK. The only example that I have is thread uh, get current, uh, get, current uh, get context class loader. Yes, that's the only one that can be overridden. Yes, so we absolutely prevent it. Uh, the adapters themselves are loaded into a protection domain which runs with all privileges. They are just really a simple uh, delegating pass-through invokers, really, so they themselves don't do anything. Uh, so we must make sure that they don't narrow the privileges in both the callee and the caller. Uh, they themselves don't use do privileged blocks, so they cannot uh, act as an escalator. Uh, but they, they, they're not narrowing the, uh, the effective uh, set of privileges either. So this is basically how we load them. We have a protection domain that we generate one that, uh, that uh, just has all permissions in it and then a class loader will be loading them. Obviously, you need to have a create class loader runtime permission for your code, but with Nashorn it's not an issue because again, it, runs in the it lives in, in a jar file in extension uh, directory. Uh, there's also an interesting question of where, can you, where do you define your adapter? This turned out that you need to do a little bit of a calculation here. Uh, we, the Java extend method allows specifying multiple, up to one class and an arbitrary number of interfaces that your adapter will implement at once. And those can actually come from different class loaders. So you actually need to find one class loader that can see the classes defined in all the other uh, class loaders plus the Nashorn's runtime classes. And now if you manage to, well, it's, a, it's, it's basically a, um, a maximum calculation on a, on, a, on a partial ordering relation of uh, IC classes from other class loader on the class loaders. And if you, if, if you can find a maximum, then you're happy and you can define the adapter. Otherwise, you can actually run into a situation where you cannot define the adapter. So an adapter that defines uh, that implements two interfaces from wildly different class loaders, well, you won't be able to do it. So type conversion. Uh, Marcus will have more about that. Uh, type conversion. String tense. Oh, string tense, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the scar tissue. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't like that. Uh, well, first thing is that class loaders do have a single parent as defined by the, in the class loader class itself, right? I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, the class loader class itself has a parent field and it has one. So uh, mul multi-parented class loaders are something that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I heard that, uh, that uh, like EE containers are sometimes uh, playing games with that, but uh, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I am willing to risk it so far that if, uh, if people are doing that, they will get an exception in their face. Yeah, you, can, you can do it for lookup, but not for the actual class loader ownership characteristic. Because of that single parent field, there's still one chain that goes up. Yeah. And there might be other issues as well. I just didn't want to get entangled into that. So um, what we do with type conversions, I mean, almost everything is fairly trivial, except for like crazy JavaScript things like the string false actually if you need to convert it to a boolean it evaluates to true because it's only the empty string that actually evaluates to false in javascript so if you do things like uh, oh well disregard the syntax at the top it, it, it actually allocates a, uh, a a java array of primitive boolean type with a size of one and then if you just do these things where you just print what does it do then you will see that uh, you know an empty array will be true and an empty object will be true because every object evaluates is true and the only the only thing that's uh, like weird is that the string false evaluates to true the picture is a little bit different if you allocate an array of uh, capital b booleans because then you have these two things that uh, null and undefined would actually we decided to evaluate them to null so if your destination type actually can represent the null value 
then if you have something that reasonably translates to null value, you will actually get that instead. So in converting to box types, we do actually preserve nulls. Uh, stuff that's nifty in our type, com uh, type conversions is that if, you, if, you're, uh, if, if you're invoking a Java method and it uh, accepts a uh, SAM type, then you can just pass a function and we will figure out, a type conversion figure out, here's a function, I need a SAM type, it will on the fly create you an adapter and uh, that uses the function as the implementation. So for a collection sort, you need a comparator. You know, it's like sort of an instant lambdafication of uh, that uh, for, 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 for JavaScript. Um, one thing that came up as I was implementing these things was uh, uh, need to prioritize comparisons. Um, turns out that the overloaded method resolution can, can trip on things. Like you create a new thread and you pass it a function. So what should it be? Should it actually be, a, should it, this be treated the function as a runnable that's passed to the thread constructor accepting a runnable? But the problem is JavaScript also allows an, an implied object to string conversion, in which case you might actually be creating a thread that's named after whatever is the string representation of the object that you passed. So the problem is, by definition, whenever your language allows more conversions than the Java language specification allows, you will be widening your set of applicable methods at every uh, overload resolution opportunity. And uh, so you will get ambiguities. That's why you need to have a mechanism to the way you can, you can yourself specify what conversions are allowed. And we actually have this. This is um, also you can implement an interface and comparison comparator that is given a source type and two possible target types and say which one of those is more appropriate. So at least for um, for the NAS on linker, uh, we, we figured out that whenever one of the types is an interface, we will decide to pick up that one because you, you, you are probably actually, uh, you, you are probably uh, going, for, going for the implementation of an interface and not uh, the string representation of the object. Uh, strings, numbers, booleans, pretty much the same thing. The problem is they are considered JavaScript primitives. So JavaScript primitive values string, boolean, and number uh, are imp implemented using the, the box numbers and booleans and, and strings. Uh, they pretty much uh, behave as such, except that we also allow uh, invocation of Java methods on them. So you can do things like foo.hashcode, and a hash code is obviously uh, only exists in Java lang string. It doesn't exist on the JavaScript uh, version. Uh, primitive conversion prioritization, I'll skip this because I will be running out of time. Uh, and I showed you this already. Okay, arrays. Uh, we ran into a situation when arrays can be nasty, right? JavaScript arrays have heterogeneous types, can grow and shrink, and can be sparse. So they are pretty much different from Java arrays in any possible way. Don't forget changing the prototype. Don't forgetting? Changing the prototype. Oh yeah, changing the prototype of the native uh, JavaScript array, but you will have a slide about that. I won't talk about this. <laughs> so while we are doing a lot of implicit conversions when you are passing to Java methods, we decided that the correct way to do when, uh, when passing a JavaScript array in place of a Java array is to refuse it. We are not doing an implicit conversion there. I mean, there's no way I will allow a potentially unbounded memory conversion to just take place implicitly, okay? So if you do this, like you use Java lang array, is it Java lang, sorry, it's Java lang reflect array, to string, if you just pass it a JavaScript literal, nope, it won't work. You will get class cast exception or equivalent. What you need to do is that this is the only place in Java, in NAS home where you need to uh, use explicit conversions. And we introduced a method on our capital J Java object, which is our only entry point to the, to the Java API. That's it's simply just named two. And, uh, and this, will, this will work. I mean, API design is always a trade-off. We can't really uh, do anything about that. And by making it explicit, we also want to, to have the programmer feel, have the, have the explicit feeling that, uh, I mean, this is like programming ergonomics, really, that they are creating something that that instance is divorced from the other one because you cannot do two-way updating, right? Because what happens if the JavaScript array gets resized? How do you represent in the original value the, 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 the newly created or, or truncated element? So this, this at least cognitively will tell them that you are creating a copy and they are, they, they, there's no two-way updates between them. 
so the Java 2 actually takes another argument as a class, and the default value for class is object array, but you can, you can use it for other things. And uh, there is a Java from, which is like a symmetrical API. You normally don't have to use it because syntax-wise, Nashorn will happily be using arrays in, in uh, Java arrays in for in and the square bracket syntax. It's only when to wa want to leverage the things that you have in the JavaScript array prototype, like map, reduce, filter, whatever, is that when you really need to convert and then run with that. Uh, component type conversion, again, you know, they have like a, homo a heterogeneous array of a number of boolean and string and you want to convert to an int class, this will use language conversion logic uh, to, uh, to convert to int element wise and our, our, our code for this looks uh, a, a little bit like this. What it does, it's, uh, it's, uh, we have these Dynalink linker services, we can ask for a type converter from your class to the component type and it just goes in a loop and uh, just do an array set and does, does, doesn't invoke exact on whatever is our type converter. And obviously I could have rewritten this to not use array set, but rather use uh, an array setter element handle and fold the other one into it. I actually, this idea came to my mind as I was writing this slide, so maybe I will change it. Uh, oh, and fun. Uh, our arrays, uh, our native arrays, they don't implement the list interface. Reason for that is that their parent, which is the script object, right? In JavaScript, array is descended from object, and object do implement map. And arrays don't implement list. Why is that? Well, it's because there's no such force that will make a class in Java implement both the list and the map, and that's because the signatures for the remove are incompatible between the two. Yeah, but you are invited. Can't win. Uh, the, hmm? the, the it can? I think I had some, I had some issues with this, no, but, but I, will, I will try it because, well, oh wait, but this is not bytecode. We actually, this is Java code. That we have like a Java code of Nashorn is like public class, native array, extends script object, implements list, bam. Yes, okay, but, but yeah. Hmm? Oh, hash code contracts also can, can be satisfied. All right, another good point. So anyway, that's why we also need to have the, the, the Java 2. So you, you have a native array when you're passing it in a place of a, where a list is expected. Unfortunately, you, ha you need to do conversion because we, we, we cannot make native array actually be a list because it, there is a parent of it that implements map. Well, you can say it's silly, but it's what it is. Statics. So. There's always a debate when you're doing a, a dynamic language whether the runtime class object, whether you use it as a gateway to, uh, to, to statics and constructors and so on. Well, we do not. Because as a Java programmer, you instinctively know what's the difference between Java IO file in your Java source and Java IO file dot class, right? There's two things. One is the runtime representation of a class and the other is just an identifier that you use as a prefix for addressing into the, uh, into the static namespace and for invoking constructors. They're separate concepts and they don't really mix uh, uh, in, uh, uh, well in a language. So what we have is Dynalink actually has a static class class, which is just a, like a little wrapper around the class. It doesn't do anything, it just contains a class. But when a linker sees one of these guys, and when you try to invoke methods on it, it will actually link you to the static methods on the class that, in, that encapsulates. It will also link to a constructors. So, um, so uh, it also has uh, synthetic uh, methods, like if you uh, link it to the get property class, it will actually like retrieve the class that's uh, below it. That's also one thing that we do. Uh, package thing, actually, I will run out of time. It's just that we have so many things that came up and I li would like to talk about all of them, but it's, uh, I, I, I have to cull things. Uh, we have this thing where packages are not really reified in, uh, in, in, in Java, right? So there is no such thing as figuring out whether a package exists. But uh, your uh, languages still, still want to like, do things like new Java util list and JavaScript, what does it do? You have like a global object named Java and you, you try to address util on it then you will uh, see, do I have a class with this name? No, well, it must, then it must be a package. Uh, and then you have problems with I, I call this the stepping stones approach and I really hate it. Um, uh, because there are typos, right? So if you say Java util array list, if you have a bit of a pirate persuasion, then uh, the thing will just say, well, maybe there's a package with that name. 
and then when you try to instantiate it, you will uh, you will have later uh, detection. Yes, Remy. Yeah. Come on. Close that. I, I have a, a toy implementation of Ruby okay. that yeah. the wall right. server util okay. something as a string and uh -huh. you resolve it in invoke dynamic. Uh, okay. Well, what we do is. Why did I put this in? So anyway, in yeah, let's skip through this. In Asm, in Asm we actually uh, support this, but we also introduced the, this Java type, where you just pass a fully qualified name of a class, and uh, it either resolves or it does not. And uh, you can typically you retrieve a class, and then you can invoke instances on it. You can, you can actually invoke like constructors immediately, except that you need to have a little bit of fun with parentheses. Otherwise, it doesn't know whether the parentheses is actually for the Java type, or it goes to the constructor. But uh, uh, the good thing is that it also supports arrays, so you don't have to do like the Java line reflect array, whatever, to, uh, to, to create arrays. I, I mean, the idea is I want to educate the users. Use this, don't use that. Maybe that looks idiomatically like Java, but you know, guess what? Dorothy are not in Kansas anymore. This is not Java, so we might do something to make you look like Java, but not necessarily, yes? I would love to uh, uh, convince Jim. Okay. <laughs> All right. And of course, I will talk a, bit, a little bit about Dynalink. Uh, Nasson embeds Dynalink. It underwent quite a lot of Im uh, improvements as results of having an actual client runtime. <laughs> if you want to adopt it, you still can. It is available as a standalone project. Licensing is the same, so you know, feel free to. But it, it, now we have a copy that's you know, package renamed in, in, in uh, JDK as well. Um, one thing that came out was like uh, Dynalink used to have uh, uh, methods for like knew about verbs for linking to a property getter, to an element getter, to a method getter, that's actually a new one. And uh, JavaScript happens to not have separate namespaces for these. So which one do you use when you want to link? And the solution I came up with was, well, you know, all of them. I uh, figured out that we can have composite uh, operations. When, when you are linking, you actually specify, specify this thing as an operation. So an object.foo will sell, say, I want a property preferably, but if you don't have it, an element or a method will also do. And if you happen to immediately invoke the thing, then I will actually prefer a method. And if you use the square brackets, then the elements get precedence. And if you invoke the something that you get through the square bracket operator, then it's a method, then it's an element, that's a property. Again, the fun thing is that when you are just linking to a native JavaScript object, they don't really care because for them, all of these link to the same namespace, but when you link to beans, then it actually can be interesting. Uh, so, of course, I rewrote the beans linker to correctly support all of them. Uh, in most cases, you can just resolve it at link time, so uh, you, you, you know in which namespace you will find it on a bean. The only exception is if you like start with a get element and what you are linking to is a map. No, in, uh, well, in that case, you actually need to have like a guard with test that cascades, try to get an element and then fall, fall, falls through to the other one. But otherwise, it's really no performance impact of this. Linking security, we're using public lookup for cacheable methods, and cacheable is almost everything except color sensitive these days. Uh, but we also correctly handle co color sensitives. I remember there was this uh, email thread on the MLVM about the introduction of the color sensitive and the issues that the Groovy folks have with them. Uh, at least if you use Dynalink, you don't have these issues, fortunately, because uh, I, I, I correctly handle those things. We have a bunch of other improvements, but I, I actually won't be talking about them because I don't have time. Um, check out the change notes on the uh, on the on the um, Dynalink uh, website. I'm I'm pretty much uh, writing about all of these there. Uh, we are leveraging it from Java in a, in a lot of places. Like uh, uh, here's actually a good uh, good uh, example is uh, the implementation of native array to string. Uh, uh, invokes the join method on the, on, the, on the JavaScript object that it operates on, which doesn't necessarily have to be a native array. So, and we implemented native array to string in Java, but we need to invoke the, the JavaScript join method on it. So what we do is uh, I have this little class that's called invoke by name, where you pass it a name and a signature, and it, and it, it will actually retrieve you uh, Go to your bootstrap method, retrieve, tell it, give him a call site for this method, and then retrieve its dynamic invoker, and then store it in the fields. And then uh, afterwards, 
when, uh, when you want to uh, use this thing, then all you do is your to, to string for na native array will say, OK, um, do the invoke the getter that retrieves me the join function on this object. And if it's actually something that's callable, then, uh, then invoke the invoker for the function. There's a few levels of indirections. But this is modulo error handling, right? Um, and I will actually be able to finish this on time, apparently. I have a few words still on security. So, security story so far. You have noticed that I've mentioned some security features from time to time. So, to recap, uh, we prevent access to non-public members in Dynalink and also to classes and restricted packages. Now, that's stricter than Java, but that's a con conscious decision so far, right? Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to be more on the safe side. So, there is a set of things that Java code can do and we like cushion this a little bit for Nashorn. So Java code with appropriate privileges will be able to manipulate uh, uh, classes and restricted packages. Nashorn code won't be able to. I stand by this decision, decision so far. I want to get it right eventually so that, uh, I mean, it almost sounds like, uh, you know, we don't believe we can get it right. We believe we can get it right, except we need a little bit more time to be sure that we got it right. So for Java 8 time frame, we won't go to, to that direction. So, uh, uh, and again, these package restrictions are only in place if you run with Security Manager. Otherwise, you can go to Sun Misc, unsafe, and do whatever you want if you are not running with a Security Manager. Uh, Dynalink also correctly handles uh, color sensitives. Nashorn will like build additional security features on top of that. Like Java Type is uh, unable to access classes and restricted packages, and we have an additional permission named uh, Nashorn Java Reflect that you need to grant to your scripts in order to be able to access class, class loader, anything in Java Lang invoke, and anything in Java Lang Reflect packages. So. Uh, Again, you know, we don't want to be on receiving end of being to blame for the next uh, uh, security exploitation. So, uh, so these and these are typically the vectors that are somehow involved in these things. So we just wholesale prevent access to these classes. Again, this is guarded by a runtime permission, which is only in effect if you run with a security manager. So if you are running in a system without a security manager, you are not affected. You can do class for name from your script. If you're running under Security Manager, you will need to give your uh, script uh, classes uh, in Java policy. You will need to specify the URLs for your JavaScript files and tell them they have the NAS on Java Reflect uh, permission, and then, then they can do that. Otherwise, they cannot. Yeah, I think I just said all of that. Um, all right, I think uh, this is all I had. This was pretty much a crash course in uh, stuff that we came across while integrating Nashorn with the underlying Java platform. Sorry if I was being a little bit fast, but I, I really wanted, I didn't want to omit anything and you know, just cramming it into 45 minutes is not terribly easy. But uh, if you were able to keep up, then thank you. If not, uh, then just catch me any time in the hallway, and I'm really happy to elaborate on, uh, any, on, on any, anything in greater detail. So that's it. Thanks.